see a growing recognition in the world that India is now getting its act together. The big issues of our times cannot be solved without India's contribution or participation. Today, India matters more in the world and we must make the most of it. I'm conscious of speaking to a generation poised on the threshold of their professional life for whom the world matters as never before. Let me take this occasion to tell you why. For a start, you might want to reflect how a pandemic that first engulfed a distant Chinese city then went on to take over your lives so completely for more than two years. Or how an ongoing conflict in Europe is now impacting our daily cost of living. And indeed, for that matter, the implications that climate events can have on the many processes that we take so much for granted. Or it could be a different kind of trauma. Terrorism, for instance, where any of us to be caught up in an act of cross-border terrorism or distantly inspired violence. In some cases, as we saw with students trapped in Ukraine or travelers stranded during COVID, that might happen when we are out of the country. But in others, be it COVID itself, conflict, terrorism, or natural disasters, such developments can come right to our doorstep, sometimes even inside our homes. Now, that does not mean that we need to be apprehensive about the world or even defensive in our approach. The flip side of the very interdependence that I underline with those examples is that the same world is full of opportunities and possibilities. If we brought back 7 million plus Indians during COVID through the Vande Bharat mission, it is because the India of today utilizes the global workplace so effectively. It is due to the fact that our talents and skills are now an intrinsic element of global innovation, manufacturing, and services. It is also reflective of how many Indians actually travel for personal, professional, or tourism purposes. Indeed, these very issues are now central to Indian diplomacy. We strive to ensure better access to our talent, stronger protection for our workers, greater opportunities for our students, and fairer markets for our businesses. But the world is not simply about mobility and migration. It is as much about partnerships, compacts, and understandings that serve all parties well. In fact, a deeper engagement could mean accelerating our national development, exploring more markets, procuring resources, improving our quality of life, and not least, shaping crucial global issues that will determine the future of our planet. In truth, the globalized era in which we live is a double-edged world. It is hard to separate the vulnerabilities from the dependence or the risks from the benefits. The very mobility that brought COVID to our homes was otherwise such an enormous source of livelihood for so many. The supply chains which created disruption when they did not function were a boon when they did. Their complexity may be hard to overstate, as indeed their salience to critical aspects of our life. Let me give you two contemporary examples to highlight this aspect. The manufacturing of vaccines in India required ingredients and products from multiple countries and actually needed diplomatic intervention for them all to come through smoothly at that time. Conversely, Many nations in the Gulf were dependent on our exports for the daily consumption of food, and that too had to be ensured 
through dialogue with them and through interventions uh, at home. Indeed, if there is one big takeaway for the global economy from the COVID experience, it is one of more reliable and resilient supply chains. The just-in-time approach with its over-centralization in a limited geography has shown its downside very graphically. De-risking the world economy now requires a balancing just-in-case policy with more centers of production. Where India is concerned, this could mean another chance to board the bus of manufacturing that we had unfortunately missed a few times before. As you can see, this is exactly what the easier to do business approach and the offer of production linked incentives of the Modi government are intended to ensure. Now the last few years have also compelled us all to be much more digital. We in India actually have a record that I must tell you through my own interactions with counterparts and people abroad a record that is generating respect across geographies. The scale of our digital delivery, whether it is food, finance, health, pension, or social benefits, the scale of it is today very much a talk of the world. Here too, the visible efficiency of the transformation has been accompanied by the risks of growing, uh, risks of data privacy, and data security. Where our data resides and who harvests it matters increasingly in an era of artificial intelligence. The political sociology of such residency or processing is no longer irrelevant. As a result, trust and transparency have become important guiding factors in digital decision making. Now, beyond the intricacies of supply chains and the vulnerability of data harvesting, there is a larger change today underway in international affairs that it's very important you comprehend. This emanates from the weaponization of everything. In recent years, we have already seen how trade, connectivity, debt, resources, and even tourism have become points of political pressure. The Ukraine conflict has dramatically widened the scope for such leveraging. The scale of financial measures, technology controls, infrastructure and service restrictions, and seizure of assets has truly been breathtaking. At the same time, it is also a fact that global rules and practices have been gamed for national advantage in a manner that can no longer be overlooked. Sharpening great power competition is inevitably creating stress factors across multiple domains. At one level, it induces greater caution about international exposure, but beyond a point that cannot be safeguarded since the very nature of our existence is now globalized. For each nation, especially the major ones, a set of answers have to be found that optimize costs and benefits. This has led to a revival of interest in strategic autonomy, now redefined as ensuring national capabilities in core and sensitive areas. In that sense, we are not just moving towards a different model of global interaction, but also one of greater national opportunities. In India, we know that as Atma Nirbhar Bharat. There's no question now that foreign policy has deep personal implications for all of us because it impinges on so many aspects of our life. It could be your safety, your welfare, your prospect, or your opportunities. It has transactional and collaborative connotations, especially in the economic and technology domains. French shoring and trusted providers are likely to be concepts that will gain ground in the coming days. As before, foreign policy is a constant exercise of building power and exercising influence, whether for national or collective purpose. 
it can be a competition too for ideas values or culture in order to set forth a vision for the future each of these facets coexist with the others much more intensively perhaps in an era of interdependence and interpenetration international relations itself is now played out in more domains with much greater integration than before but precisely because it impacts each one of us so deeply it is essential that we have an obligation to take interest in the games that nations play now it is a paradox that in many ways even as we speak about the advancements of technology and the promise of science world politics is actually moving back to the future some of this arises from the reality that expectations placed on globalization proved to be over optimistic this is not to suggest that the underlying economic interdependence is not well founded but by widening differences between and within societies and creating new global power equations a different set of counter forces have now been set into motion once challenges began to be articulated the globalization model was actually not easy to defend because the benefits were heavily skewed in favor of a few the political manifestation of globalization has also created its own backlash when self appointed custodians of correctness sit in judgment over global happenings across a very wide set of domains they cannot get away with it forever especially when they themselves have a vested interest in the outcomes to add to that there is also now a proclivity to advance national methodologies that often verge on the mercantilist we therefore have a situation where political and social identities have sharpened sharpened to a point where they create an inherent and unresolvable tension with the nature of economic flows in the world consequently different nations are struggling to find an optimal balance though the reason for each one of them may be a little different some seek to address regime security others want to protect their technology leads or sometimes their way of life and still more who would like people like us for instance who would like to build capabilities without exposing them too early to a competition that is often manifestly unfair these endeavors are likely to be among the fundamental characteristics of world politics of our era the our globalized world is likely to be both fractured and semi coupled in select areas there is moreover old fashion national rivalry also at play it hasn't really gone away in a globalized world especially after 2008 the world has seen a sharper rebalancing and the emergence of multipolarity the shifting terms of us engagement to the world in the last decade is one dimension the ending of a forever war in afghanistan appears to herald new ways of ensuring its security and furthering its interests the rise of china is an equally profound development one whose global consequences are becoming more apparent with each passing day that so much of it is happening outside orthodox constructs is clearly challenging conceptually to both policy makers and to analysts far from being a zero sum game these developments have actually opened up space for other players some essentially regional but some with greater potential clearly the world perceives india to be in the latter category to this dynamic process the ukraine conflict has now highlighted the centrality of russia and the strategic awakening of europe if this matrix looks complicated then the volatility is further compounded by the uncertainty of the larger global arena the unfairness of globalization and the stresses of the covid experience have been aggravated by the shortages and costs that derive from developments in ukraine 
As a result, we are headed for a far more uncertain, I would say even insecure existence than we may have predicted just a few years ago. Now, such a prospect clearly calls for more diplomatic energy and greater political creativity because it has to harmonize the pursuit of national interest with a responsibility for collective good. For a nation like India, where such a large segment of our population is so vulnerable, this means, above all, to mitigate the impact of key negative trends. In doing so, we not only stand up for our own welfare, but we speak as well on behalf of the Global South. At the same time, we also have an obvious stake along with them in cooling down overheated global politics. This is obviously not going to happen overnight, yet we must persevere. But beyond the immediate compulsions, there are structural challenges of the current world order that confront us. The oldest trick in the diplomatic book is to freeze the moment to your advantage. That, in fact, is what some countries have done with multilateralism since 1945. Pursuing reform in that domain, especially in the United Nations, and striving to ensure that decision-making reflects democratic reality is therefore a quest of no small importance. Allowing the past to dictate terms is, however, not just a predicament that can be attributed to others. Sometimes it is actually a mindset or an assumption that we impose on ourselves because of a particular moment of our experience which continues to resonate. Thus, even 60 years later, the 1962 conflict with China shapes many of our attitudes. Our hesitations with the West similarly derive from the experience of 1948, 1965, and 1971. This even applies on the positive side of the ledger, where it can lead sometimes to unintended complacency. The 1992 economic reforms, for example, were impactful enough that the need for continuous building of national capabilities was not given the requisite priority till recently. We are now in a phase where both the ability and the responsibility for shaping the global landscape are much greater. It is expressed in new concepts that reflect our interests like the Indo-Pacific, mechanisms like the Quad or the I2U2, or initiatives like the International Solar Alliance. Even on the economic front, we have been judicious in the manner and extent of engaging the world, picking the FTAs and framework that truly serve our interests. For all of us, the security of the nation obviously should come above all else. My own experience is that Indians are much more conscious of national security than many other people, since it has been so often challenged in the last 75 years. Indeed, when we evaluate the merits of leadership, for us, it is largely perceived as a mix of development delivery and crisis response. A lot of our foreign policy is devoted to preparing for, obviating, mitigating, and reacting to national security threats. But clearly, a time has come when we need to decisively address long-standing vulnerabilities that a competitive world regularly exploited. We need to equally apply ourselves to the hard task of securing our borders effectively without allowing systemic flaws to dilute them. At the same time, as the world penetrates into our daily existence more prominently, we must develop the awareness and responses to the problems that are actually posed by the normal this could be digital, it could be financial, ideological, or sometimes just old-fashioned mobility. So even as we overcome constraints, hurdles, habits, and sometimes black swans, it is absolutely necessary 
for the young generation to understand how the world looks at us now. Indeed, many of the very challenges of the last few years have earned us great credit for coming through in the manner in which we did. There are, to my mind, 10 broad reasons why we are now taken more seriously, even as we are moving towards becoming a leading power. And those 10 reasons are, one, our handling of the COVID, including vaccine production, shots in the arm, the COVID platform, and vaccine Maitri. Two, the robust economic recovery and the digitally enabled socio-economic delivery on a massive scale. This is important because the global economy continues to face serious headwinds. Three, our growing economic relevance to the world, reflected in greater FDI inflows, greater manufacturing, stronger exports, and an embrace of startups. Four, an independent foreign policy in an increasingly polarized world, one that also speaks for the global south. Five, an innovative diplomacy that has introduced new concepts and platforms, as I mentioned, without according a veto to others on our choices. Six, a resolute national security policy that has seen us standing up to daunting challenges in the border areas, even during the COVID period. Seven, a determination to look after our own abroad, be it Operation Ganga in Ukraine or Operation Devi Shakti in Afghanistan. Eight, a willingness to look out for others and often serve as a first responder in humanitarian or disaster response situations, especially in our own neighborhood. Nine, contributing to a global betterment through initiatives in solar energy, disaster resilience, maritime security, and counterterrorism, amongst others. And 10, a perception that India as a civilizational state is finding its place once again in the global order. Now the combination of changes in our political standing, our economic weight, technology capabilities, cultural influence, and the successes of our diaspora is moving India today into a higher orbit. But let us not underestimate the task ahead. For any power to rise in the global order is never easy. But to do so amidst the turbulence that I have described is doubly difficult. But nevertheless, we see a growing recognition in the world that India is now getting its act together. Equally, there is a realization that the big issues of our times cannot be solved without India's contribution or participation. This is a moment when India resets the terms of engagement with the world. It is also a juncture where we should be prepared to take up greater responsibilities. So, for those who are starting off in life, like so many of you, I can only say that there is every reason to be confident. India today has a leadership and a vision, as well as the perseverance and the commitment to enhance its global standing. To those more experienced who have been part of our national journey for the last 75 years, they will surely appreciate the transformation underway and the opportunities that it has generated, opportunities perhaps that my generation did not have. But to all of them, I would only say that I'm sure that they share the conviction that today India matters more in the world and we must make the most of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jayashankar.
we take back much to think ab about from your lecture today. And I'm sure it will inspire future graduates and others to introspect and perhaps recalibrate their choices to deliver better on the needs of uh, the India to enable the country to lead the world. We'll now be opening the house for questions and answers. And for this, may I request Professor Bhaskar Chakrabarti, our Dean Academic, to please moderate the Q&A session. Thanks a lot, Abhishek. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaishankar. Um, we have received a few questions, and maybe we could take them first. Um, before the talk, we were telling Dr. Jaishankar that this is going to be a curated Q&A. And he smiled and said that curated Q&As are good, but sometimes they do look curated. <laughs> So uh, when, I, when I read the student's name, um, if you are there, if you could please stand up and identify yourself, unless you are already standing because the auditorium is full. Uh, so the first question from Shankar Vinayak, MBA first year. Hi, Shankar. OK, uh, maybe I can read, read out your question, and then you can add. Um, one of the principles of Indian culture is that of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. How do you think we might apply this principle to develop relations with Central Asian and African economies? You know, um, uh, would you like to add something more? No, okay. Uh, look. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up for this reason. Uh, I was uh, in New York uh, this September. Uh, every, every September, you know, all the, the 190-something countries of the world gather in New York. Uh, and I met roughly about half the foreign ministers uh, who were there. And I cannot tell you how much our our contribution, more than that, our, I would say, mindset during the COVID has impacted the world. There were, there were countries, countries in the Caribbean, countries in the Pacific, countries in Africa, who came across, and you know, some of this, by the way, is in YouTube. I'd, I'd encourage you to look at it. Uh, and none of them were curated, huh? I must tell you. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were actually people who said, look, we want some platform, somewhere we want to say this, that our first vaccine came from you. It came from you when you were still vaccinating your people. Uh, and, and we know there were others who were better off than you were, who actually probably had more vaccines uh, per capita than you did but you had the heart to give it to us. So, you know, it's, we speak about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, world is a family, etc. The reality of, of that COVID era was also we saw the, the selfish side of the world. I mean, there were countries who, who clamped down on, you know, there was a big struggle in 2020 for uh, for PPEs and masks and ventilators and, um, you know, the initial set of medicines. There have been countries who are incredibly generous. There have been countries who are not. I'm not passing a judgment on those who, who may not have, uh, uh, you know, done all that they could have. I'm only saying today uh, the feeling in the world about what we did I think Indians need to know this, appreciate this fully, because sometimes we ourselves take good deeds for granted. You know, uh, we live. You know, we are we are a big society. We are in the midst of our own debates. We most of the time are busy talking to ourselves. Uh, but there is an enormous goodwill today in the world, including, by the way, uh, uh, in Central Asia, uh, Africa, Central Asia, other parts of the world. 
but put covid aside for a moment you know uh, you would be uh, perhaps a little surprised to know how many countries in the world today we are active in sharing our development experiences that when we speak today of digital delivery or we say okay we are, you know our renewables has grown or we are doing distance education or we are propagating uh, e health i mean a lot of this has actually happened in different parts of the world uh, again you know in a way perhaps it's not a story which uh, often gets uh, sort of uh, coverage at home but over the years i would say particularly in the last decade our global footprint india is seen today also as a provider of experiences of best practices of sometimes of resources sometimes of opportunities so when i speak about rising in the world you know rising in the world is not just an accumulation of power smart power is also one where you make friends i mean the the oldest management book in the world making friends and influencing people you know a lot of diplomacy is about making friends and influencing people and uh, i would uh, suggest to you if you if you go through a lot of what the world says about us you will find uh, that very very interesting thank you so much uh, the next question from avilash maji second year mba student hi avilash uh, given the change in the risk of global supply networks how could india benefit from promoting entrepreneurship in defense and integrating it with innovative defense product manufacturing there's a related question from a student from our mba ex program deepthi mishra mm -hmm. um the question is about independent foreign policy where dependence is always there and inevitable in trade defense culture and technology uh well uh let me you know i i think that's that's accurate i don't think in this day and age any country can say we are not dependent on something question is the extent of your dependence and what you do to mitigate it uh my own view is uh over the you know we went through a certain period a certain model you can say from the 1950s uh, till the 19 early 90s okay that model fell short which is why we had the economic reforms and then from 19 last 30 years you can we generally talk of being in a much more reformist era but in this period a country of the size of india the bigger you are actually the more important it is that you are not hugely vulnerable to the world you will never be autarkic but you cannot be completely exposed for your on your very basic needs to the world perhaps if there is and i say this as self criticism you know of of a system i mean after all i have been in that system for that whole period uh, that the system did not pay enough attention to building the deeper strengths the supply chains the domestic industries the smes and i contrast this because i have had the good fortune of living abroad coming back to india going abroad so i do a lot of my contrasting is with other societies when i look at a japan a korea or a china and saw how at a time of economic growth they also developed their own you know domestic supply chains for a bulk of their requirements uh, i think there are big lessons to be learned there Uh, and today uh, i i would say there is this big corrective happening uh, that the uh, the government is very very determined uh, there is an industrial policy which is aimed at building manufacturing i mean if you look at the percentage the proportion of manufacturing of in our economy that's not the number we should have it should be very much higher uh, so there is a big push today being given to manufacturing and again to do that we need to attract manufacturing uh, interest from abroad as well 
because our greatest resource is finally people. Uh, my sense is when I look today at the big changes which are taking place, for me, I, I can see a big change taking place in the semiconductor industry. Uh, I was in the US uh, recently last month and I heard that from the semiconductor association there that American companies alone employ 40,000 Indian engineers in design of chips. Now, we need, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great if our people have global opportunity, but it's also essential that our entrepreneurship take full advantage uh, of that. And I am a very strong votary of greater industrialization, of more manufacturing. I think this idea that we are naturally born service economy, very bluntly, is a cop-out. Uh, I, I think this is a way of rationalizing uh, our failures. Uh, I, 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 you know, a country like us has to have a manufacturing muscle if we are to go up in the world. So thank you very much. Our real uh, sorry. And, and by the way, that applies especially to defense. And, and the interesting thing is, We've just come out of a, so, you know, uh, uh, we, we just come out of this de defense expo just now in Gandhinagar, and one of the readouts this time was how many Indian companies, especially Indian startups, turned up at Def Expo, and there are young people today who actually have uh, produced things which, uh, which uh, are making our armed forces look up, and when we see the the uh, the procurement of our own armed forces domestic versus foreign. I can tell you there's a very big shift in the last few years. So I see a lot of possibilities there as well. Oh, thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> Next from Nandan Guel, MBA second year. Nandan is asking, given your expertise in negotiations, what kind of challenges do you think are unique in international negotiations as opposed to corporate negotiations? You know, uh, all of us negotiate all the time. Sometimes we don't know it, but we do. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you are a, a professional negotiator, in fact, the biggest problem you have even in your own family, your family suspects you are negotiating <laughs> uh, all the time. <laughs> now, the difference between uh, international versus corporate. By corporate, I assume you mean domestic corporate. Huh? Uh, I mean, one, when you are negotiating, what is the big challenge? The big, it's not only negotiating. I mean, negotiating, competing in any way, is to read the mind of the other party. I mean, that's, that's what it is. So before they make their move, you have anticipated their move. They have probably anticipated what you have anticipated and you have to now figure out the next step. Okay. And it's, it's true in negotiation, it's true in sports. You know. I mean, if you, today, if you watch a cricket match, you know, the person coming into bat is trying to figure out who's going to bowl and the person going to bowl has figured out how the person going to bat is going to react to what he's going to bowl. So, life is negotiation. But the challenge of negotiation is to understand the, the mind of the other party. And in a cross-cultural setting, I mean, what makes international negotiations hard is the other party is literally foreign to you. That their mental makeup is not something that is readily understandable. So what often happens is, you know, a lot of politicians are very, very comfortable negotiating at home because they are in their own milieu. They, you know, it's like playing in your own pitches, okay? You, you know the pitch backwards, you know every bowler, you know every player, your field setting is perfect. But if you're on a tour abroad, that's why tours abroad are very challenging. Because now you're in an international setting. You know, you, you haven't got all the parameters, you haven't read uh, the minds of that person. That's on international. What the, on the corporate, since I had uh, a brief incarnation there, I would say, you know, it, it Many of the same principles apply. Perhaps one difference is uh, sometimes the stakes are much higher uh, in 
in the international ones. Sometimes. Need not be. Some corporate ones can be deadly serious, uh, serious as well. But I would, you know, uh, if I were to take my three incarnations, if you would, the long foreign, the diplomatic incarnation, the short corporate interaction, and now my learning, my, my, I'm, I'm a student of politics for the last, practicing politics for the last three years. I would still say the international one is the most complicated because there are so many more variables that you have to digest and sort of get your algorithm uh, prepared for. Next from our MBA EX student, Atul Sethia. At the start of an MBA program, we are expected to change our outlook and make it more holistic in order to prepare for the second leg of our careers. We saw you transitioning from a foreign secretary to a foreign minister. What was your transitioning experience and what was the most important learning from it? Uh, just to fill in my curriculum with a in-between from foreign secretary to foreign minister, I did one year in the corporate world. Huh? Okay. okay. And I mention it because I still maintain, uh, no, I still maintain that was my MBA degree. <laughs> you know, a, a year with the Tatas was the best MBA degree anybody could have got, at least the, the exposure uh, that I had. You know, trans look, uh, quite seriously, uh, I would say uh, there are a number of aspects to it. Uh, one between being, uh, I mean, as a civil servant, I was the civil servant head of my ministry. But it's one thing to be that. It's something else to actually have the next layer of responsibility, which is you're now accountable in the cabinet, in the parliament, to the public, uh, in a sense to the world for, for that particular vertical. So uh, it is to, you know, sometimes nothing really prepares you for a transition except a transition. Uh, and you have to have the ability to learn on the job. I mean, the, you have to keep reminding yourself that there's so much out there you don't know. And if you have the, I would say, the openness of mind to, today, someone at my stage and age, you know, two things happen to us, okay? One, you actually get smarter, younger people. You know, there's a huge problem uh, sometimes because you attribute, there's a sort of uh, unconscious uh, 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 sort of, uh, shall I say, inclination to correlate uh, wisdom and experience. Sometimes actually smartness is non-experience. You know, you are, you are not in that mode. The other part of it is when you move into a new domain or a different domain, and a political domain is very different. You know, there are so many more things which, uh, I mean, between me as foreign secretary and me as foreign minister, I have a, another set of variables which I didn't know or wasn't exposed to as foreign secretary, which I am exposed to by sitting in the cabinet, by meeting other ministers, by doing politics, which therefore, you know, give me a, a super holistic perspective in a sense, you could say. So, so it is, it is a, uh, it is a, uh, sort of constant challenge but I would say you one if you enjoy doing what you do and I think you can all see that I apparently do uh, uh, that uh, but the other part of it is really you must have that in anything you know you must have that openness of mind because uh, even say when I was ambassador you know you arrive in a place sometimes you've never been to that place before in your life after you've been there 10 days, the rest of the system thinks that you should answer every possible question or problem relating to that place. So how do you parachute, you know, into something and, and immediately become operational? That's, that's a great skill. 
and it's a skill you get by being very very willing to to listen and to learn from everybody you know it, the, i mean i don't want to call it it's it's not a humility okay it is actually an openness the recognition that uh, you know you should be uh, because at the end of the day that osmosis has to work next one from professor shomith paul shomith asks in the recently held glasgow summit india has committed to achieve net zero by 2070 what do you think are the major operational road blocks specific to india to achieve this goal and what might be the expected role of the financial sector in removing such road blocks you know uh, I, i mean you can call it road block i would use the word challenge in a way look it's not a uh, a problem specific necessarily to india the biggest problem has been that at every uh, cop at every meeting you get promises of finance and it's really like groundhog day you have that same conversation one year later the next meeting and if you look back from kyoto onwards the fact is that uh the promises of climate finance have never been taken seriously by the developed countries you know they they keep saying it then you know they will do very creative finance uh, creative numbers to show something the reality is this you know the vehemence of the rhetoric has never been matched by putting money on the table this to my mind is actually the biggest uh, problem and it the and nowadays the the new narrative is you know private sector will come and put money now the reality is the private you know the private sector will follow if if that is the direction in which the world is moving so ultimately that kind of green finance climate finance has to come from governments has to come from multilateral development banks it has to be government led so that private sector feels that's where it is moving and let me make a business out of it so i i feel that the very basic issue still uh, you know is uh, is still sort of very unsatisfactory it is not uh, i mean in many ways the developed world is being uh, is stringing the developing world along and there is mounting uh, frustration i think in large parts of the global south uh south on this maybe we could open up for a couple of questions um could you please pass the mic around if you are asking a question if you could please identify yourself and then ask a question i could see many hands we might be able to take two or max three yeah please go ahead uh, hello sir uh, i'm rahul kumar marwal from the uh, one year mba program so you mentioned uh, games between nations uh, how can we use our influence probably through quad to make sure that the transfer of f16 doesn't happen to one of our uh, mischievous neighbor <laughs> the transfer of f16 is already happened yes. no i mean <laughs> uh, so it doesn't happen in i mean in in near future probably. no look uh, i i why i said the games nations play partly it's the name of a famous book but in a sense you know i take games uh, uh, competition uh, i mean it's it's a it's a similar uh, sort of attitude i mean at the end of the day uh, people are aware, are uh, you know countries it's it's all really about countries uh, competing i think rather than go the pathway which you put it uh, there is a issue which uh, which we have tried to bring out uh, which is that you know if you look at the last 75 years it has not served the world well by propping up uh, uh, a military dictatorship by a country over arming at the expense of its development by 
then getting into a mindset where they do things which nowadays you know civilized countries don't uh, which is for example uh, support uh, terrorism against their neighbors so it's 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 a it's an entire package i think it's important for the world to realize and and frankly even for that that particular country to realize because it has not served that country well either you know i mean if you see uh, you know after all uh, all of us do performance evaluation of ourselves uh, i think if the countries of this region uh, did their performance evaluation there are some stand out lessons out here uh, and uh, uh, i i i think it's important for the world to realize that and it's you know clearly uh, that's a messaging which we will keep sending out sometimes it has a greater impact sometimes it has a less impact sometimes people have their own angles or their games if you would so that's the way it is thanks sir yeah so good evening sir my i'm <coughs> kamal agarwal i'm a auditor by profession and actually i'm myself going through a career transition as well so oh, welcome to the club picked up a few mm. things from you on this mm. uh my question is more you know we we spoke about looking at india leading the world nation building and and all that while looking at all this how to deal with the internal issues that we have as a country today more political i would i'm alluding to and i have two actually points to make over there are other things to reflect on one is many times we see political gains more often than not take precedence over national interest we see that happening so often and the other is uh, how do you have a strong country building up when there isn't any strong opposition in the first place we have the government but there's not a strong opposition also to kind of keep the you know a kind of a little balance around the functioning of the government so how does all this kind of combine together to put india in a leadership position then you know uh, look i would agree with you very much that uh, it's it's important uh, that uh, uh, we put national interest first uh, that uh, the politics of the day should not trump the in a sense the larger interests of the nation and clearly um, that's a that you can say is a is a discipline or a uh, or a approach that you know all politicians should have in the country now it's obviously easy to say uh, it doesn't always get done and you know i i in my own remarks i cited two examples i mean if you if you look uh, at the whole article 370 issue i mean uh, let's be honest other than the politics of the day what was the reason for a temporary provision to continue so long it was really the politics of the day and the fact that we had such a uh sort of uh, messy issue there i mean the entire world used it for the last 75 years so uh, and the other is really securing our borders you know that uh, the that the politics of the day should not lead our borders to be vulnerable uh, so uh, i mean i could come up with other examples uh, so i i agree with you i think to some extent we have to create a culture to some extent public opinion has to also you know public, the force of public opinion is a very powerful force you know uh, politics responds to to what is politics may shape public mood but believe me public mood also shapes politics i mean uh, as again as as a relatively new entrant into this i can tell you when i look at people you know in my peer group and see how how you know how polit the sort of the sense of the public resonates with them it is it is something which matters on the issue look you know uh, you you spoke about uh, strong uh, opposition it's not the job of the government to create an opposition okay <laughs> <laughs> it's it's i mean it's but but bear in mind we are a very diverse country you know we are a diverse pluralistic country so sometimes i feel this this obsession uh, 
uh, that you know somewhere we're all going in one direction uh, i i don't think to me that's not the reality of this country you know this is a country it has its own uh, uh, you know uh, it has its pluralism it has its diversity it has its checks and balances it has its democracy uh, you get very overblown rhetoric but i want you to step back for a minute and tell me every time there's an election in this country you know everybody argues about it till the election results comes out everybody follows the election result okay now i can tell you a few places they still debate it so so my point is uh, i feel our politics you know our governance our systems we have lot of room to grow i am not at all suggesting anywhere uh, you know if i were grading it i would be a little bit uh, uh, you know maybe strict about it but the fact is we also have many things we have done which we should be proud of when i go around the world and i look at some of these debates uh, around the world i mean in this country uh, if you you look over the last 50 60 70 years who can say that the life has not got better i look at how much more inclusive we have become not in terms of tokenism but inclusive in terms of prosperity opportunities i mean i i would say if you were to take your own students i i guarantee you your current cohort the people in this room would be much more diversely uh, you know in in diverse in their origin and in their uh, you know Uh, in their education then it would have been 10 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago and and to me that's proof that system is working system is delivering maybe the last question hello sir uh, my name is mahesh my question is the uh, any special policy regarding the agriculture industry because we know that uh, we are depend on the other country for the fertilizers and chemical raw material yes uh, uh, you know it is uh, it is you know somewhere you remember we had a uh, somebody asked this question about dependence uh, that was said more in the context of uh, uh, defense but if you look today at uh, what are the uh, big imports of india the big imports of india are oil oil and gas uh, electronics and fertilizers these are actually like right up there the problem with fertilizers is lot of them you know a big part of the fertilizer industry is directly linked to gas yeah. so there are uh, there are uh, limits to what we can make economically uh, at home but this is where diplomacy comes in that uh, it is today uh, for me you know when people speak foreign policy diplomacy it's not that airy fairy stuff you know saying the right things at the right place etc to me these are bread and butter issues if i at the end of my day say today i have made sure that an indian consumer is paying less for the petrol at the petrol pump an indian farmer is assured of fertilizers at the right time an indian household is getting its you know food and cooking oil at the right price to me these are really my benchmarks of what is successful diplomacy and uh, uh, for uh, in the last few year uh, last few months especially after you know the ukraine conflict started uh, but even prior to that we have been working very hard at diversifying our sources of fertilizers at trying to uh, reach uh, long term understandings with suppliers so that we stabilize it uh, for our farmers uh, we've had a reasonable measure of success out there i mean there's still uh, work to be done but it is something very important because i do see a period where i i am absolutely convinced that this country will emerge actually as a, a serious agricultural exporter uh, and uh, you know you raise fertilizers i actually put to you something very different we are you know this this 2023 is an international year of the millets hmm? 
if you look at the tradition the history of millet uh, production in in uh, india it's a very long history uh, you know a lot of people ate millet till the new cereals uh, came along so uh, so there are big possibilities there and definitely the interest of the farmer and making sure that you know fertilizers are available in equal you know reasonable quantity is very important i think that you said there's one more question Namaste, sir. Yeah. yeah please uh, Namaste, yeah, if sir, you could, can, if you can could ask question please. just stand up and yeah so, please do. yeah this would be the final so can we take question. one question from the top Uh, uh, I wanted to ask that uh, you talked about globalization and technology and the global supply chains and how does it affect the current scenario. So considering our uh, neighbor and considering that Taiwan is a mega hub for semiconductor fabs, uh, how do we, how, what is our diplomatic stand regarding Taiwan? Shall I, in interest of time, shall I take that one also? I think that would huh? be nice, yeah. yeah. Uh, namaste sir uh, my question to you is that uh, how does the mood swing of uncle sam affect our algorithm to deal with them <laughs> uh, you know uh, is it, that's it huh? ah, okay I think we'll okay uh, look uh, uh, today there is a big uh, semiconductor debate going on in the world you know how do you uh, hedge the risks uh, on in the semiconductor uh, business? Uh, and uh, where India is concerned, uh, there is, uh, no, no, please, please. Uh, where India is concerned, you would have noted that uh, we've also started a semiconductor mission. Uh, uh, again, as I said, you, you know, we can always say we should have done something before, but at least better we start doing it sometime. Uh, so there is a very, very big push today by the government to encourage uh, Indian industry uh, to, to uh, sort of advance partnerships with foreign, uh, you know, technology providers or foreign chip makers or uh, foreign fab owners uh, to see how much of that industry uh, can come. Now, it's a very tough industry because it has very, very high specs. Uh, so we will have to upgrade the environment for an industry like this to come. It's not something which is, which is uh, uh, very easy to do. Uh, but, the, you know, if you s look at the last few years, if I had told you 10 years ago that, look, you would start getting smartphone manufacturing in India more or less at the rest, you know, the, the same as the rest of the world, you would have taken it with more than a pinch of salt. But that is today happening. So we believe it can happen. We have a policy to make it happen. We have incentives to make it happen. But we understand also this, you know, does require uh, uh, creating that kind of larger environment, not just a physical environment for production, but even, uh, you know, a knowledge environment, an educational environment uh, for the human talent uh, for a semiconductor uh, business. Uh, on the, on the mood, mood swings, well, look, it's, it's like this, uh, you know, the United States in many ways is a very unique country. Now, I mean, in a way you can say everybody is unique. But when you are number one in the world, when you are the big, most powerful country in the world, then their uh, uh, uniqueness impacts everybody else. You know, uh, if some other country which in uh, economic terms or power terms is number 150, and they have a bad day, maybe the rest of the world will not notice it. But when you are number one and, uh, you know, things go this way or that way, uh, it, it, it actually has uh, global repercussions. And, you know, a lot of it is because uh, you have, in many ways, uh, the, the consensus within the American establishment has frayed uh, over uh, the last few years. That has been very visible. Some of it is their electoral cycle also, that they have a four-year presidential cycle, but they have a congressional cycle of two years. So uh, there is that. And then they have a separation of powers, which again is very unique. I mean, uh, 
uh, the, the, there are very few countries where the, uh, the legislature has such an autonomous position uh, from the executive. So the, the point is that uh, they, there are a number of reasons why uh, I would say uh, managing the relationship with the United States requires a certain uh, devotion of uh, uh, time, energy, uh, understanding, uh, chemistry, call it what you will. And I would say, you know, last 20 years we've not done a bad job. I mean, I, I would give myself decent marks. Decent marks. Thank you, sir. Shri Krishna ji and Dr. Jashankar have been very liberal with time. Shri Krishna ji was asking why not that question and why not this one. What they possibly do not know is that we all wake up after our classes get over at 6. So the full energy comes at 8.45 in the evening. And if we, if we really wish to go on, we could go on for at least another three or four hours. So we'd rather stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Jashankar.